Good morning. Good Good to see everybody today. Hope everyone is doing well. As mentioned, we do have several visitors with us today, and we are excited that you've come our way, and I hope that you can come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street at your every opportunity. You are our honored guests here today, and we hope that you will be uplifted and edified by being with us today. After services today and after eating a little lunch, my family and I, we will be uh, heading to Tennessee for the Freed Hardeman Lectureship for this week. Uh, so if you would, keep us in our prayers as, uh, in your prayers as we travel. Uh, but you're in for a treat tonight. Uh, Brother Kerry Huter uh, will be speaking tonight. Brother Kerry always does a great job. And we encourage you to come back tonight at 6 o'clock and enjoy a great lesson from Brother Kerry. Brother Kerry will also be teaching the auditorium Bible class on Wednesday night. Uh, We will be back on Friday, and so we will look forward to being back with you next Sunday. This morning we're going to consider two conversions, but one of which is seldom seen as a conversion, but it includes all of the principles that are involved in the act of conversion. Conversion literally means a changing from one state or condition to another. It is a turning toward one direction and a turning away from another. And it's crucial that we understand the process of conversion because it is essential to our salvation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, If we are not converted then we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. In each of the instances that we're going to consider this morning, we're going to see that a conversion took place, a change from one relationship to another. But one of those conversions was away from God, and one was a conversion toward God. One was a conversion from serving God to serving the devil. And the other is a conversion away from serving the devil and toward serving God. First, let's consider the process involved in what we will consider, at least for the purposes of our lesson today, the conversion of Eve, the first woman. We first find her with her husband Adam. They are in that place of perfection. They're in the garden and they're innocent. They're sinless. They're guiltless. And they're in fellowship and in a precious association with God. They're living in paradise in the Garden of Eden. But later on we find that their circumstances have changed. For we find that they both are now subject to death. They are in sin They're suffering the consequences of that sin. And they're now cursed as a result of engaging in sin. We find that they're no longer in the garden. They're no longer in that place of perfection. They're no longer in paradise on earth. But they've been driven from it and barred from re-entering it because of their sins. They no longer have access to the tree of life, and thereby death enters into the world. Their lives have made a complete change. So in a sense, a conversion has happened. A change of state. A change of condition. And Eve, by the process of conversion rather than turning to God, has turned away from God and has turned to the devil. But I want you to notice the steps that she took to get to this place. The steps that she took in this conversion account. Well, first we see that she heard a message. There was a preacher present. The preacher was the devil who came in the form of a serpent. He came and he delivered a message to her. 
We notice in Genesis chapter 3, the first five verses. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God had said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Well, of course, we know that this message was a lie, but it was sprinkled with just enough truth to give it some plausibility. Sprinkled with just enough enticing information to draw Eve in, to make it sound reasonable, to make it sound like this is something that is possible for them to have. Now we know that the death that they were going to incur, that they were going to suffer, that this was going to be a spiritual death. They were not going to be struck physically dead on the spot if they ate of that forbidden fruit. But it was going to be a spiritual death of separation from God because of sin. So in one sense, the devil was telling the truth. In one sense, in her saying, you shall not surely die. Well, they weren't going to die immediately. They weren't going to die physically at that very point. But because of sin. They were going to die spiritually. They were going to be separated from God because of that sin. But also, we see that there was a little bit of truth sprinkled in there in the fact. Because Satan comes along and says, God doesn't want you to do this because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be God's. He doesn't want you to have knowledge beyond what you already have. Now, if they ate of that fruit, their knowledge base would be expanded because they would come to know the consequences of sin. They would come to know what it was that they had done wrong because they became aware that they had disobeyed God. Their knowledge base certainly expanded. But the devil came preaching a message that sounded good. Preaching a message that was enticing. And sprinkled with just enough truth to pull her in. Sadly, we see the same thing taking place many places today. So many times and so many places today, people aren't satisfied to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh, they'll throw in a little bit here and there to make it sound good. To make it sound enticing. But it's going to lead to the same result. It's going to lead to sin. It's going to lead to spiritual death. Eve heard the message. But did she have to believe it? The message was there. It was in front of her. But did she have to believe it? Did she have to accept it? No. But she did. Because as the text goes on to say, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Yes, she heard the message. She heard the lie. And she believed it. She accepted it. It all seemed good and right to her. It appealed to her. She felt like this was the thing to do. But she was deceived. So many times people are made to feel safe and secure by that which is false. Are made to feel happy. Made to feel, made to feel satisfied in their faith. Because ultimately, folks, what it comes down to is we have the ability to believe a lie.
The message is out there. And we have the ability to either accept it or reject it. We are confronted with temptations on a daily basis. Are we going to accept it or are we going to reject it? Eve heard the message and she accepted it. She was deceived. But did you notice the suffering that came upon her and Adam did not come at the minute that they believed? They heard the message and they believed what it was that the serpent was telling them. But notice the punishment did not come at that time. It wasn't enough for them simply to believe that lie. An action had to take place. She had to take action based upon her faith. And I know it's hard and can be confusing to think about these concepts of conversion and faith from a negative standpoint. But we see that it can be that way. She had to act upon her misguided faith before that punishment came. And the Bible says she did eat. Her faith coupled with her obedience to that message. Misguided as it was, led to her conversion from being in God's favor to being in God's disfavor. A conversion took place. She heard a lie. She believed that lie. She obeyed that lie. She acted upon that lie. And as a result, she was punished. As a result, a conversion took place. She converted from faithfulness to unfaithfulness. And as a result, sin and death entered into the world. But now let's talk about our second conversion. About 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost, when they opened their eyes that morning, they were lost. But as the day went by, a conversion took place. By the time that the day ended, they had become children of God. They were saved. They were in the kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, Peter reminded them that some of the ones that were there on that day were the ones that just 50 days prior, less than two months prior, were standing there shouting, Crucify Jesus! Crucify Him! Some of the very ones that were there hearing Him had a hand in that. But then He began to preach. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, He stood up and He began to proclaim a message on that day. And as He spoke to that assembled mass, he began to convict them. And even though when those 3,000 souls woke up that day, they probably did not have the realization that they had crucified Christ. They were probably thinking, well, the Romans carried that out. That's on their hands. That's on Pilate's hands. This has nothing to do with us. But now when Peter begins to speak, he reveals to them that the blood of Jesus Christ, that promised Messiah that they had been looking for for generations, was on their hands and on the hands of their children. They were guilty of crucifying Jesus. But as they listened to that message, some of those that assembled there, they began to believe it. They began to gladly receive that message. So much so that they cried out. And the way I picture this is Peter is still up there preaching and they stop him and they say, hey, what do we need to do? You have pricked our hearts with the Word of God. We are convicted of the fact that we are lost. What do we need to do in order to be saved? They wanted to change. They believed the message that they were hearing. 
Well, as we see in Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter told them they needed to repent and be baptized. And as we read further on down in the chapter, we find that about 3,000 souls were baptized, those who gladly received the word. Those who believed it, they heard it, they believed it, they acted upon it. Just as Eve had done in, in the negative sense, we see the Jews now doing in a positive sense. A preacher was there. A message was proclaimed. They heard it, that, that, that message. They believed what they heard. Now they're acting upon it. And when the sun sets on that day, they're saved. They've been added to the body of Christ. What's happened? Conversion. Conversion is what has happened. The hearers believed what they heard. They were pricked to the heart by that message. And you know something that we need to understand? The Word of God should be pricking our hearts on a daily basis. It's not something that should happen just at the point that we realize we are lost and we need to be saved. Each time that we open the pages of God's Word, if we see something there that does not measure up with the life that we're living, that should prick our hearts. It should break our hearts to the point that we want to change. That we want to turn away from those things. That we want to become more like Christ. But on the day of Pentecost, they were pricked by the gospel. They believed what Peter had to say. The evidence was there. It was laid out before them in a way that could not be denied. They accepted it. Being told what they needed to do in order to be saved. Notice they didn't stop right there and say, Well, no, I've heard the message and I believe it, therefore that's enough. They cried out. They said, what more do we need to do? What do we need to do to get our life right? Peter said, repent and be baptized. Act upon that faith. Take those steps of conversion. And those that gladly received the word were added to the body of Christ. Their sins were washed away. They were converted. Folks, we need to understand the essentiality of conversion. We need to understand that it is a condition of our salvation. We have to be converted. We cannot become a Christian and stay in the same state we've always been in. We can't become a Christian and stay in the same condition. It's like we talked about in our Bible class this morning from the concept of discipleship. We have to become true followers of Jesus Christ and not settle into the belief that it's okay to be a Christian in name only. We have to take action. We have to live our faith. When Paul was describing the condition of people before their salvation in Ephesians 2 and verse 12, notice what he said. He said that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Of course, here he's talking to the Gentiles. He said that before that time, they weren't part of the nation of Israel. They didn't have the promises. They didn't have the hope that was there. But now, they're able to have those things. But if you're not converted, if you're not a child of God, you have no hope. You don't have God in your life. It's because of sin. That we become separated from God. It's because of sin that we must be converted. 
We read in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Folks, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We cannot be saved in that sinful state. We have to make a turn. There has to be a change in our spiritual condition. And that comes through conversion. The reason why we are converted, Acts 3 and verse 19 tells us that our sins may be blotted out. Is there anyone here today that would honestly say we don't want our sins taken away? I hope not. We don't want to go through this life with those sins continuing to weigh upon us. We have the opportunity to lay those things aside. To bury those things away in the waters of baptism and to be raised in a newness of life. To be converted. But when we think about that process of conversion, it all begins with faith. We hear the Word of God and we believe it. Eve heard the words of a lie and she believed it. But the Jews on Pentecost, they heard the words of truth. They believed it. But it's not enough to just believe it. Repentance changes our mind. Repentance means that we are no longer focused upon the things of this world, but that we have turned away from those things. That we're no longer devoted to that. We're living as God desires us to live. But then, something that has become more meaningful to me the more that I have studied this concept, is the concept of, con- uh, of confession. You know, we're told that when we confess with our mouth, that is voicing our allegiance to God. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation, Romans 10 and verse 10. When we confess, and you've heard me say this many times, and I'm going to say it again, confession is not a one-time thing. It's not something that we do just that one time before we're baptized into Christ. But confession is to be a daily, courageous proclamation that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we're going to live our lives based upon that confession. We believe it, so we're going to live by what Jesus tells us to do. We love Him, so we're going to keep His commandments. But then baptism is where that change takes place. Baptism is a change of state. As Paul reveals to us in Romans chapter 6, when we're buried into that watery grave of baptism, we are demonstrating that we are being crucified with Christ. We are crucifying that old man of sin. Leaving him there in the waters of baptism. And we come up out of those waters with a hopeful expectation. And that expectation is a change of life. A renewing of our spirit. We're now in a new state. That's why we're said to come forth walking in a newness of life. It's because the blood of Jesus has taken the old away. The blood of Jesus has forgiven those sins. Has put us into a new state. We've turned away from sin and we've turned toward God. Conversion. We've made a change. Therefore, as we see, as we go through this life, conversion can take place a couple of different ways, can it? 
We can be converted away from God as Eve was. Or we can be converted to God as those Jews on the day of Pentecost were. And it's through our faith, repentance, confession, and baptism into Christ that we change our focus. We change our mind. We change our allegiance. And as a result of that, God changes our state. We don't change the state ourselves. God is the one that adds us to the body of Christ. God removes us from the world and places us into His kingdom. God is the one that changes us from non-Christian to Christian. But the question we must all ask ourselves this morning is this. Have we been converted? Have we truly put aside our old state of living? Have we all laid aside the things of this world with that old man of sin? Have we put him to death in the waters of baptism and been raised to walk in newness of life? Are we living that faithful Christian life today? Or it may be that you're here as a child of God, but something has happened. Sin and temptation have come in and have caused you to convert away from God. To fall away from the faith. One of the great promises that we have as children of God is that if we realize that we have turned away from God and we're willing to repent of our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and restore us back to His fellowship. What a precious promise that is. Do you need to be converted today? Are there things in your life that you need to turn away from? then don't wait. Don't put it off any longer. If you're here today and you realize that you're not a child of God, then we would encourage you today to convert from the world. Turn away from the world. Turn toward God. Come forward and make known that spiritual condition. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Let us assist you in being baptized into Christ if that's the state that you find yourself in. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we encourage you to come at this time while together we stand and sing.